Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to explore the notion of the Godhead archetype. With me is James P. Driscoll, who is a scholar of Renaissance literature. He is the author of The Unfolding God of Jung and Milton. He is also the author of the Identity in Shakespearean Drama. He's one of the world's foremost authorities of Jungian interpretations of literature. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure to be with you. You know, when we use the phrase, the Godhead archetype, there's a lot to unpack because it has Jungian metaphysics and psychology, plus uh, the notion of the Godhead itself, which is a theological notion. Yes, uh, though looked at simply, Godhead refers to the nature of deity within the context of a culture or perhaps a subculture. And Jung had his own uh, particular conception of Godhead, which I could get into, but it should be remembered that other cultures, uh, Islamic culture, Hindu culture, Buddhist culture, and so on, would also have their, their conceptions of Godhead or the essential nature of deity which would be quite different from, from Jung's and quite different from each other. Well, some cultures are very explicit about creating images of what they consider God to look like, and other cultures forbid the, the very notion of an image. Well, that's a visual image. Yeah. Uh, the, the culture that is most notable for forbidding it is, of course, Islamic culture, but while they don't define what God is, is visually, or they don't even allow uh, pictures of uh, or representations of Muhammad, uh, they are exceedingly specific about what God is in other respects. Mm -hmm. For example, what God requires of humanity and how he interacts with humanity and so on, much more specific than than other traditions are. Now, you've used the masculine pronoun just now, and that's pretty endemic to Western culture. We think of the Godhead as somehow male. Well, that, that, that's a very interesting point that you raised, Jeffrey, because uh, originally, according to scholarship that has mostly been done in the 20th century around the, the figures of the feminine companions of God, Sophia, and so on, originally, uh, God had, the Judeo-Christian God had feminine companions and uh, Sophia was the most notable one uh, and uh, uh, Sophia was identified with the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. but uh, It's due another to, word for wisdom as well Oh, uh, Of course, of course uh, but due to the influence of Greek philosophy that was prevalent at the time, particularly the Neoplatonic Platonism and uh, Philo Judeus and uh, the Alexandrian school, uh, they believed that God w must be perfect. He must be the sunum bonum and perfect, and uh, therefore he must be male because the feminine is imperfection, stemming from Eve and all of these uh, basically misogynistic myths mm -hmm. that were prevailing in the culture then. And, and since, too. Uh, so what they did was they basically made the Holy Spirit neutral. It was no longer identified with, 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 with Sophia, though in the Eastern Orthodox uh, tradition, this continued. Remember, their greatest church is the Hagia Sophia yeah. in uh, Constantinople. And so th there was th this shift. The feminine disappeared from the Godhead due to the influence of Greek uh, philosophy and Greek uh, or, uh, based prejudices uh, and uh, it was replaced by something that, that, that was neuter. Now this disturbed Jung because he uh, uh, said that the Godhead has to reflect wholeness, human wholeness. Now Jung believed that the Godhead uh, should reflect the self and the whole of the individuation process 
it should be a path to the Godhead, and the self leads you to God. Uh, now, you've used the word should here, which is interesting. I would have thought Jung might have said the Godhead does represent the self. Actually, uh, that's true as well, and perhaps mm -hmm. more true mm -hmm. than, 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 than what I just said. Uh, well, what he say, when we use the word should, uh, yes, the Godhead does represent the self, and if we're going to find God, we should find God through the self rather than through the ego. Mm -hmm. And so it's important that God, uh, the Godhead, our concept of God, be uh, re reflect the self rather than a particular ego. Now, the problem that has occurred is that if you take the Old Testament God or a lot of other representations of God, uh, it comes across as kind of a patriarchal uh, male, uh, t uh, the head of a tribe, a sheik, or something like that. Uh -huh. and filled with vengeance at times. Filled with vengeance and ang angry for various things, very demanding. Uh, a, if you move on to St. Paul, this uh, deity has a strong sense of honor. So he comes up with the theory that the honor of God was uh, uh, offended by mankind's uh, eating the apple. Mm. Uh, the, and this all had to be atoned for. Uh, uh, so you had Christ come down, and, uh, or you had the, God sends his son to yeah. be sacrificed for, for man's sins and mm -hmm. all of that. And it's a question of, the, of God's honor being mm -hmm. offended. Well. Uh, Jung, I think, would say, honor is a conception of the ego. It's not a conception of the self. Mm -hmm. uh, integrity is a conception of the self, but uh, honor is, is, is not. Well, now we're getting into Jungian psychology, and implicit in Jungian psychology, it seems as if uh, there, there is a whole metaphysics in, involved. For example, now we've talked about the Godhead archetype. Let's define for our viewers what Jung meant by archetype. Uh, Jung was basically a kind of a, plate, a Platonist, and this is a fundamental pattern uh, of the way the human mind works. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, God is an archetype and it's derived from the self. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's all, there are archetypal drives. It's used in very many and complicated ways, the, the term archetypal. There's an archetypal drive in humanity, uh, which might be called the religious drive, mm -hmm. the dr drive to seek meaning, to seek something greater than the, the, than, than the self. Jung believes that this is uh, uh, derives from the ego's realization perhaps subliminal in most cases, that there is something greater than, than the ego, which is, of course, the self. And we become in contact with this through dreams. Uh, when you're and, using the word self the way I might use the phrase higher self, I think. Yes, yes. Uh, I don't use it to be synonymous with ego mm -hmm. at all. Uh, the, the self is not, it's, con, it, it's, it's, maybe hyper-conscious, mm -hmm. trans-conscious. Uh, it includes much more than what we uh, consciously think about and perceive mm -hmm. uh, at, at an ego level. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it includes uh, the nature of our basic humanity. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the ego is more like what is particular to us, to you, Jeffrey, as an mm -hmm. individual, right. or to me, Jim. Uh, and the self is more what is common uh, to all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, egos are always particular. The self uh, is not as, as particularized. So when, when Jung uh, suggests that the Godhead archetype is really the archetype of the self, he seems to be suggesting that at a, at a very deep level of consciousness or maybe even unconsciousness, uh, there's, there's a certain identity uh, of the self. We are godlike in some sense. That's true. And Jung said uh, that, uh, I do not believe that God exists. I know that God exists because I know there's the self 
And essentially what he believed was that the self reflects the order of the universe, but there is an order of the universe to be reflected. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, you know, uh, the most obvious element of order in the universe is time. There's a past, a present, uh, a future. They, they don't become all jumbled together. Mm -hmm. They're always the same in an order. If we look out there, we find other uh, things that we identify as order, perhaps not so fundamental as time, but there, there's gravity uh, operating and uh, uh, light and darkness and well, there are uh, many th symmetries like this. And, and and dualities, male and female, good and evil. Yes, uh, which are, are implicit in in the Godhead. Yes, there's a lot. There's a number of dualities, but there's also a tripite na na nature. It's he's, as he sees it is essentially there's duality, there is a tripite nature, and there's quaternity. And so let me mm -hmm. explain uh, at. Essentially, at the very, very beginning, as mm -hmm. Jung develops it in answer to Job, uh, you have Yahweh, who is like this tyrannical father figure that doesn't have much consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the beginning, the initial archetype and manifestation of the Godhead. Then there's a split, and that splits into what he calls the two hostile brothers. And the, that's a big archetype that is recurrent throughout Jung. Mm -hmm. And the two hostile brothers essentially are Lucifer uh, and Christ, or the Son of Man. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's this opposition uh, there uh, th that is between shadow and uh, ego consciousness, mm -hmm. uh, something that is unruly and fundamental Dionysian, Dionysian and Apollo, uh, Apollonian would be another way of, of putting this. So you have that opposition, but the opposites according to Jung have the term enantodromio, and they, they always turn into each other, they always uh, kind of uh, form a, a synthesis. Like yin and yang. Like yin and yang, mm -hmm. Ye yes. And so the synthesis, as I've proposed, uh, and I th have said that this is implicit in you, though he doesn't make it explicit, lies in the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so you have a kind of balance in the Godhead. You have f three parts that are male, mm -hmm. but then... The classical you, trinity. Yeah, the cla well, the classical trinity, y yes, uh, and no. But, but th three okay. parts that are male, uh -huh. and then one part is female. Or, or, so the three male parts, God, the Father, and Satan, I presume. Yeah, yes. Okay. But the female part is the highest part. Mm -hmm. So that allows for a kind of balance, I see. <laughs> you see. All right. And uh, Jung is also very, so you have four, and Jung saw the, the, the psyche as being following a quaternal or fourfold pattern. Mm -hmm. Uh, in many, many different ways. So, mm -hmm. Like there's the four functions, thinking, feeling, sensation, intuition. Yes. Uh, and, uh, but he also saw uh, three as a fundamental number because after all, time mm -hmm. is three, past, present, and future. It's something right. totally essential. Uh, so, and that's the dialectic. There are three stages in the dialectic. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, you you have the three, and then you have this opposition in the middle stage of of the opposites. Thesis and antithesis are the 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 middle stage. Uh -huh. The initial stage is kind of an un, a, a pre consciousness, the unconsciousness that you get of Yahweh, where all of these things are mixed in together, and the separation has not occurred mm -hmm. of the opposites. Mm -hmm. Then the synthesis is at the top stage. Okay. So, so, so there are four. four. Four, four parts to the Godhead. To the dialectic, the unconscious, unformed notion, the thesis, four the parts, antithesis, and the synthesis. Four parts, three stages. Okay, that, that's how it works. All right. Uh, now, yeah, you ran into, in my opinion, a major problem in that he did not see, the, uh, and. Uh, it's very curious that he didn't see this. I, I don't really understand why he didn't see it, and it's not been largely recognized by the by the Yugian since. But uh, the big question: Why didn't he he, he see uh, the importance of the Paraclete 
or the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. or Sophia mm -hmm. being feminine. Yeah. He s perceived that, but it just didn't dawn upon him that this is hugely important mm -hmm. and this is the potential solution to what he saw as he saw two major problems with the Godhead. Mm -hmm. you're, now you're referring to Western culture, the Abrahamic tradition. Exactly. He saw two ma ma major problems. One was with the Christian Godhead, mm -hmm. okay? One was that the feminine was absent, mm -hmm. and for wholeness you need the feminine. Yes. The other was that the shadow was ab absent. In the Jungian schema, you have the ego, the light of consciousness, and uh, uh, what uh, uh, Freud would call the superego, mm -hmm. all of these rules and so on. And then you have the shadow, or, may, or you could call it the id, mm -hmm. which is all of these uh, counter forces that represent the, the Dionysian and the, the more primitive instinctual impulses of man. So you have those two in op opposition. You said, well, this id part is not there, therefore, uh, this image of the Godhead is inadequate, incomplete. Mm -hmm. It's not whole. Right. Furthermore, there's nothing feminine. Mm -hmm. And there's always the feminine. Uh, as you know, there's anima and animus. Yes. The anima is the uh, feminine part or spirit of the psyche. The animus is the, uh, the masculine part. Uh, typically, women have an animus. Men have an anima, mm -hmm. and uh, for you, understanding their psyche uh, required a great deal of energy uh, or uh, attention dealing with these two things because mm -hmm. these are, are very complicated and dealing with the whole issue of sexuality for, bo for both sexes. Well, but this had to be present in the Godhead. So he didn't see the importance of uh, wisdom, Sophia, the paraclete, mm -hmm. and he said, well, Mary. We'll bring in Mary. Now, l l let me backtrack for a second. You've mentioned this term twice, the paraclete. Can you define that? Uh, it's really another term for the Holy Spirit, mm. okay. uh, the, the, the dove. Um, and, uh, but, so he, he was very impressed when the Pope in, maybe it was 1949 or, or thereabouts, uh, put some sort of encyclical in which uh, the uh, Mary's status was, was raised. Elevated. E elevated, yes. And, and he thought that this was uh, a, a good step in the direction of bringing wholeness in, into the Godhead. Mm -hmm. And he acquired a lot of support and interest in Catholic theologians because of that. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, he came out with the answer to Job which said, well, Satan, too, is part of the Godhead, and they, they wanted no part of, of, of that. There's less enthusiasm for that. Yeah, yeah. but it, it's just, uh, mysterious, and Mary really isn't an appropriate part, in my opinion, of the Godhead, because you could put her down there with the father. Uh, the, there's the, the father and the mother, Jung mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and. Uh, the Old Testament start out with the father and the mother, but something more, I'm with the father, but something more, Yahweh, but something more primitive is to have both the father and the mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that that's where Mary is, the, the primitive companion to, to the father. Uh, and what the paraclete and uh, uh, Sophia represent is the archetype of the wise old woman. Mm -hmm. Now, you have the archetype of the wise old man, but that archetype uh, is uh, perhaps more commonly, or at least as commonly, the wise old woman, uh, the, just the, uh, the top archetype right. of this wise old person mm -hmm. is uh, more frequently somewhat more frequently at least, seen as feminine, mm -hmm. uh, probably because the feminine represents something common, calmer, mm -hmm. harmonious, more accepting mm -hmm. than uh, the male does. Yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, he didn't uh, see all of this, and this is something that I've always been interested in, in developing and laying out. Now, Jung believed that the Godhead uh, is very uh, important 
for affecting the the health of a culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, that an imbalanced Godhead ref reflects an imbalanced culture. I I exactly. Mm -hmm. And while he didn't exactly say this, uh, you could apply this to Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, they would disagree with this, of course, but uh, it appears, particularly if we look at the Hadith and, and well, at the Quran as well, there's a lot of material there which uh, presents God as rather like in personality, a, a, a patriarchal desert sheik, mm -hmm. uh, very male. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, so it, it's, it appears to be more an ego thing. And than, you get the same thing in the Old Testament. A, a, exactly. Or, or the Torah. Mm -hmm. Well, well that, that's w one of the thoughts which the, the uh, Islamic scholars might not disagree with, that, mm -hmm. uh, that Allah is sort of going back. To, uh, they might say that this is a, a truer, Allah is a truer perception perception mm -hmm. of the original deity yeah. of, of Judaism mm -hmm. uh, and that they're returning to, to, to that and it's been corrupted along with Greek ideas and Christianity and uh -huh. la later uh, Judaism. I, I suspect they would probably look at it that yeah. way. But in any case, for, for those of us uh, alive today, I suppose we have a certain amount of uh, creative uh, initiative in terms of how we picture God as individuals. Uh, how do you mean? Well, Jim, I think a lot of our viewers are people who would consider themselves seekers. They're exploring the visions of God that are held in, in many, many different cultures. And I think people today, at least uh, a segment of the population, uh, maybe a small elite segment, but they're there, are trying to redefine uh, what the deity means for them. Each individually, they're forming their own uh, unique idea of the Godhead. Yes, I think that's completely correct, uh, and that those people number in into the tens of millions, mm -hmm. uh, and they're, they're resisting the consumerist and materialistic uh, distractions uh, of our society. And the conventional and, theological interpretations as well. Yes, and the, but they're following the f a more fundamental human impulse or archetype to seek the self, the, to seek understanding of uh, the universe, of their life, of meaning, and, and so on. This is, this is a, something that has always propelled uh, religion forward, uh, and more consciously as time has, has gone on. Uh, and uh, there may be p more people who are thinking about these things in a more thoughtful way than at any time in the past, but they're not at the forefront of, uh, of our cultural awareness. We're mm -hmm. not hearing about them in the New York Times or uh, on, on television or anything like, like this. Well, because it's very personal. It's very personal, and they're drowned out by so much noise mm -hmm. of uh, the, the other di distractions of our uh, increasingly uh, uh, exploding culture. <laughs> but, but I would bet that Jung had it correct when he talked about the individuation process relating to the Godhead archetype and, and, and the self, uh, or the ego moving closer to the true self. And so I suspect that many of these people are actually cultural leaders, thought leaders, innovators. Um, even if they don't explicitly publicly discuss their inner spiritual progress. Uh, maybe I would use the term pioneers. Yeah. Uh, uh, le leading sort of implies that there would be a, a following, mm -hmm. though they, they, I would, it's correct to say that they're on, on a leading edge. Mm -hmm. uh, it's unfortunate that, that there aren't more of them and that this is not uh, more pervasive in the culture itself because it might have a tempering influence on uh, a number of the really yeah. bad trends that, that, that are out there. It might uh, uh, lead people to be more uh, respectful of uh, the environment and nature and the planet it's, itself and uh, uh, 
uh, things like that. Well, you mentioned several times in this interview that you have a personal interest in redefining the Godhead archetype even more than Jung himself. Uh, well, I'm not sure if it was more than Jung. I think that we're placing more emphasis on the feminine than Jung did. Yeah, I think I wanted to, st to step beyond Jung. And the, I'm not wanting to set myself up as superior to Jung, but sometimes people can only go so far and another generation has to take things the next step. Because uh, what Jung did himself, he broke a lot of uh, uh, icons. and. Uh, uh, you know, there's the idea of standing on the, so uh, the shoulders of giants, mm -hmm. and certainly in science, you, yeah. you know, someone may be going beyond Newton, but it doesn't mean that they're, they're greater than Newton, they'd be usually much lesser. But still, they're, they're, they're beyond because mm -hmm. they have the advantage of standing on his shoulders. Well, we do have that today. Yeah. We have the advantage of standing on Jung's sh mm -hmm. shoulders and, and everybody else who w was uh, wise and uh, 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 insightful. This has to do with us. the mystery of time, which is such a uh, interesting topic for you. We'll have to come back and do another interview on that. Uh, that would be fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jim Driscoll, it's been a pleasure doing this interview. I think it's useful to mention to our viewers that you are indeed one of my very oldest friends. We were college housemates together back in 1968. In 69. Yes, and discussing those things, these things, even then. Even, <laughs> even then. So it's been a conversation that's gone on for decades, and hopefully we can uh, have more occasions to share, share these thoughts with our viewers. Yeah, yeah, yes, and uh, hopefully maybe a couple more decades, too. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Thank you so much for being with me, Jim. Okay, uh, you're very welcome, Jeffrey. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.